1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today comes from the book of John 17, verses 22 through 24. And if you did happen to watch, because we didn't have a show yesterday, but I did air in place of my show because I was traveling. This is the reason I wasn't able to do a show yesterday. The sermon that I gave on Sunday night. And you may notice that I use this verse sort of as my, my wrap up, my conclusion, but it's such a rich passage of scripture. And I think that there's actually a lot more than I said about it last night that we could draw from this. And to understand what is going on in this passage in the Gospel of John is Jesus is offering a prayer for his disciples. He is praying to the Father about his relationship with the disciples, the disciples' relationship with each other, the disciples' relationship with the world. I mean, basically every aspect of Jesus' disciples, the twelve apostles, he is talking about them, and he's also kind of talking about the disciples in the more general sense. In other words, just the people that that follow him, beyond just the twelve specifically that we think of. Now, when he gets into this prayer... This is how he, he starts sort of his conclusion and wrapping it up and talking about how he wants his relationship to be between him and his disciples. This is Jesus praying to God. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Now, there's a lot of theological truths that we could unpack from that. You know, one obvious one is that Jesus Christ is eternal, that he is God. He's talking about him himself and God being one and that they already are one and that he was with God before the foundation of the world. I mean, there's, there's a ton in that verse. But I want to narrow in on this specific lesson that we can draw from this, and that is where Christ is talking about unity. I don't claim to have a perfect understanding of the Godhead, and I don't know that any human being on this side of eternity ever really has. I mean, it's a concept that I think you can get closer to the truth and further away from the truth, but it's something that's really difficult to grasp no, at, no matter really where you are in your spiritual journey. And at a certain point, you do kind of have to just sit back and say, I understand what I think God wants me to understand about it, and I think I have at least a working knowledge of it, and, and God has given us the adequate amount of information that we need to understand to be able to serve Him and to please Him. But he certainly haven't, has not given us an exhaustive explanation of how all that works. And that's okay, because we don't need that. If we did need it, God would have provided it. But he didn't. So it's pretty safe to assume that that's not something that we actually need to have a complete understanding of. But he does expect us to understand at least aspects of it. And one of the things that I really get from that, this particular verse, I think, really personifies the idea of spiritual unity between the three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Because you'll notice what Jesus is talking about there is he's saying, Father, I want to be one with my disciples, and I want to dwell in my disciples the way that you dwell in me. I want to have that oneness. I want to have that perfection of unity with them the way that I have perfection of unity with you. See, now that's important because what Jesus is talking about there, what Jesus is signifying by saying that is that they do have perfect unity. And part of the purpose of that perfect unity, whether it was, I don't know if it was necessarily intentional or not, it seems to be, that the relationship that God wants between himself and man is a reflection, a mirror image, something that is modeled upon his relationship between 
him and the other two parts of the Godhead, which is fascinating. Because we always kind of think of it, and I've done this too, we always kind of think of it as God's relationship with us, and then he kind of threw this metaphor of being the father of Jesus on so that it'll help us easier, it'll help make it easier for us to understand. It seems as though we've got it backwards. The, the relationship between God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost came first. And then when God created us, he wanted a similar relationship between us and the Godhead. Not the same, but at least similar in some ways. Which means that God was the Father first. And that wasn't a metaphor that he just created to make it easier for us to understand. That's the relationship, that's the perfect unity in perfect obedience that they had beforehand. And we're supposed to learn from that with our own familial ties. It's the reverse of what we usually think of it as. And so, with that perfection and unity, what Jesus is talking about, that relationship that he has with the Father, that means that our relationship to one another and our relationship to Jesus is supposed to be something that looks actually pretty similar to what Jesus has with God. And look at all the things that the aspects of Jesus' relationship with God, and that's especially prevalent in the Gospel of John. It talks about being perfect in obedience. It talks about him being humbled before him. And even in this very passage, Jesus is begging for God's glory to be seen through him. Why? So that they, talking about the disciples, can know you. If you wanted to sum up the mission of Jesus Christ in, in one verse, John 3.16 is a great one. There's other verses that I think that you could say are, are, are a perfect little uh, eggshell, a, a little nutshell example of what the gospel is, but I think this is one of them. Jesus is saying, I want these people to have a relationship with my Father. I want them to have perfect community and perfect unity with Him. And because of that, I'm coming to earth to make sure that is a possibility. That's what the crucifixion was all about. The whole reason that the crucifixion was necessary is because we were separated from God the Father through sin. And Jesus said, I I've got to figure out a way to fix this. I've got, to I've got to do something to repair that broken relationship. And the crucifixion was the answer shedding his own blood so that we might be forgiven of our sins and once again have that communion with God that we were always intended to have. See, in a lot of ways, unity was Christ's mission. To reunify a father with his younger brothers. That's what Jesus Christ came here to do. And he's saying, Lord, I want other people to see the glory that you've given me so that they'll come to know you. Well, isn't that the relationship that we're supposed to have with other people in the world, other brothers and sisters too? It's not to show off. It's not to show, hey, how perfect we are or anything like that. It's, I want other people to see Jesus Christ living in me, not so they can think I'm so great, so they get to know him. I'm just an arrow pointing in that direction. That's all I'm doing. That should be our goal in life in the first place. That we act as a beacon saying, hey, this is where the water of eternal life lies. This is the way to be able to live abundantly and live eternally. This is the way, the truth, and the life. Go. I'm showing you where it is. Go now. It's important. I've partaken of it. It's made a huge change in my life. That's what I want for you. That's exactly the attitude that Christ is putting on here. He's saying, I have this amazing relationship with God the Father, and I want you to have it too. This is how to do it. And he spent his entire ministry conveying that message. That's the kind of life that we should live. We'd say, look guys, my life has been irrevocably and wonderfully changed by the lifestyle that I'm living now. But here's the thing. In order to be able to do that and to do it effectively... Our lives have to actually look like Jesus. They're not going to be able to see the glory of Jesus through us the way that they saw the glory of God the Father coming through Jesus unless we actually are doing what Jesus did, which is 
acting that out and living it out. And so if we're going to be these beacons, if we're going to be these giant signs pointing to the living water that Jesus talked about, then we have to live the way he lived. We have to follow his teachings, because otherwise, when we say that, that's going to fall on deaf ears, and it should. Because if we're not living the way that Christ told us to, of course our mission, and of course our message is going to fall flat. I just think it's fascinating that in verse 24 there, that Jesus is actually saying that I want God to be with my followers, I want them to be with me, and to learn about me, so that they can get to know God. That's what Jesus Christ came here to do. And if we want other people to have that same relationship with Jesus and God the Father that we have, to have that perfection of unity that Jesus is talking about, we've got to follow the example of Christ. Do exactly what he did. And this is something that actually is a little bit hard for me, honestly. Not just because living like Christ is literally the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life, but I'm talking about the motivation You see, by nature, I'm an introvert, and I'm not really a people person. But Jesus was. And I'm not saying that you have to be the most extroverted person, that you have to constantly be around people, but if you're like me, and you're coming from that kind of background to where you like people, you like being around people, but you don't want to do it all the time, and and, you'd rather spend the majority of your time just hanging out by yourself, there needs to be at least some tension there to where you do feel this this urge and, you know, sometimes even the obligation, if that's all you have, to go out and to make disciples and to preach to others because that's what Jesus would have done. We see that in the gospel over and over again. There's all kinds of times where Jesus kind of wants to go off, be by himself, pray, and then it says that the crowds caught up to him or people came around him and started asking them to heal him or provide, you know, provide something for them. This happens all the time in the Bible. And when I look at that, it reminds me that just like Jesus had a responsibility to these people and he felt obligated but also joyful to be able to help them out, that's the attitude that I need to have too. I say this somewhat preaching to myself, but for us to be this beacon of glory, for us to uh, be a beacon of glory to, to show God's glory to living through us and to show other people where the life abundance is, then we've got to be out in the world. We've got to be out there talking to people. We have to be willing to and excited to tell people about Jesus Christ. And that's something that doesn't come easy. But luckily, we have an instruction manual on how to do it. Jesus Christ was the perfect example of that. And we have him to follow. Stay the course, friends. So now they have this fancy new technology where you click on one of these boxes and it takes you to another one of my videos. Hopefully it works a lot better than the Obamacare website or the DNC's Iowa caucus app. Gotta love that big government central planning.